Have you ever pondered why homosexuality exists among men? It's a question that has intrigued scientists, philosophers, and curious minds for centuries. But before we dive into this fascinating topic, we must first establish a fundamental truth. Homosexuality is not a choice. It is an intrinsic part of a person's identity. Let's journey back to the dawn of human history. Evidence of homosexuality has been found etched onto the walls of ancient Egyptian tombs, woven into the tales of Greek mythology, and documented in countless other civilizations throughout time. The existence of homosexuality is not a modern phenomenon, it's a tale as old as time. Now let's take a trip around the globe, from the colorful and vibrant LGBTQ plus parades in San Francisco to the quiet acceptance in some remote tribes across Africa and South America, homosexuality is not confined to any one culture or region. It is a universal aspect of the human experience, transcending geographical boundaries and cultural differences. In fact, the prevalence of homosexuality is not exclusive to the human species. Scientists have observed same-sex behavior in hundreds of different species from penguins to dolphins. So when we talk about homosexuality, we are not discussing an anomaly or a deviation from the norm. Instead, we are acknowledging a natural and widespread aspect of life on Earth. However, understanding that homosexuality exists is just the first step. The question that often follows is, why? Why does homosexuality occur? Why are some men attracted to other men? It's a complex question with no simple answer. A puzzle that experts from various fields, biology, psychology, sociology, have been trying to piece together. But here's the thing. Humans are not equations to be solved or codes to be cracked. We are beautifully complex beings, each with our unique identities and experiences. And that's what makes us human. That's what makes us, us. So the question of why becomes quite intriguing, doesn't it? Science has been trying to unravel this mystery for years, and there are several theories that have been proposed. Let's dive into some of these biological theories related to homosexuality, shall we? First up, we have genetic theories. These theories suggest that homosexuality might be a trait that's passed down through families. Think of it like inheriting your mom's stunning blue eyes or your dad's knack for burning toast every single morning. Some studies have found certain genetic markers associated with homosexuality, but the research is far from conclusive. It's like trying to find a needle in a genetic haystack, and the needle might not even be there. Next on our list are prenatal hormonal theories. These theories suggest that hormonal levels in the womb can influence sexual orientation. It's kind of like how the temperature determines the gender of some reptiles, except it's hormones and humans. If there's a certain cocktail of hormones present during critical periods of fetal development, voila, you might have a gay baby. But again, this theory is still in the maybe pile. Last but not least, we have the fraternal birth order effect. This theory proposes that the more older brothers a man has, the more likely he is to be gay. It's like nature's version of hand-me-down clothes. The theory suggests that the mother's immune response to male fetuses increases with each son, affecting the development of future sons. It's fascinating, but like the other theories, it's not a guaranteed explanation. So, we've got genetic theories, prenatal hormonal theories, and the fraternal birth order effect. It's like a buffet of theories, each one more interesting and complex than the last. But remember, these are just theories and none of them have been definitively proven. It's like a never-ending episode of a detective show where we're still waiting for the big reveal. But isn't that what makes science so exciting? The possibility of discovery, the thrill of the unknown, and the promise of understanding. So, let's continue to explore, to question, and to learn. Moving on from biology, let's delve into the psychological and sociological perspectives. Now, before we venture further, remember, these theories, while intriguing, do not suggest that homosexuality is a choice. Rather, they explore how our environment and experiences might influence our sexual orientation. First, let's look at the psychoanalytic theory, developed by the famous Sigmund Freud. Freud proposed that everyone is essentially bisexual at birth, and our upbringing determines our sexual preference. According to him, a complex series of events during childhood could lead to homosexuality in adulthood. But let's not forget, Freud's theories have been widely debated and are not universally accepted. Next up we have the social learning theory, which suggests that homosexuality can be learned through imitation or conditioning. It proposes that if a person has a positive experience with someone of the same sex, they might develop a same-sex preference. But again, this theory isn't without its critics, who argue that it oversimplifies the complexity of human sexuality. 
Then there's the gender non-conformity theory. This theory suggests that individuals who don't conform to traditional gender roles in childhood are more likely to identify as homosexual in adulthood. However, this theory has been challenged too, as not all non-conforming children grow up to be gay, and not all gay adults were non-conforming as children. Lastly, there's the theory of social constructionism, which argues that homosexuality, like all sexual identities, is a social construct. It suggests that society and culture, not biology, define what is considered normal or abnormal sexual behavior. But this theory, while insightful, doesn't fully explain why homosexuality exists in virtually every culture and society throughout history. In summary, these theories suggest that environmental factors, upbringing, and social constructs might influence homosexuality. Yet, it's important to stress that none of these theories suggest that being gay is a choice. So it's not all about biology, our surroundings and experiences also play a part. Now here's a crucial point to understand, human sexuality is complex. Human sexuality isn't just about who you happen to find attractive. It's like a vast, intricate tapestry woven from threads of identity, relationships and personal experiences. It's about how you see yourself, how you connect with others, and the unique journey you've taken in discovering and accepting who you are. Let's take a moment to debunk a common myth. There's a misconception that there must be a one-size-fits-all explanation for why homosexuality exists among men. But that's like trying to describe a rainbow using just one color. It's impossible, isn't it? Because a rainbow is made up of a spectrum of colors, each one distinct yet contributing to the whole. In much the same way, human sexuality is a spectrum. It's not a binary concept like an on-off switch, it's more like a sliding scale with a vast range of possibilities. Some people feel attraction to the opposite sex, some to the same sex, some to both, and some to neither. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Each person's experience of sexuality is shaped by a unique combination of factors, biology, environment, culture, and more. And this complexity is something to be celebrated, not simplified. Because it's this very complexity that makes us human, that makes us unique, that makes us, us. So the next time you hear someone asking, why are some men gay? Remember that there's no single answer. It's a combination of many factors, all interwoven in the tapestry of human sexuality. And remember this too, that it's okay to be different. It's okay to be you. Because in the end, that's what matters most. Not who you're attracted to, but who you are, your identity, your experiences, your journey. So let's celebrate the complexity of human sexuality. Let's embrace the diversity it brings. Because it's not just about attraction, it's about identity. It's about relationships, it's about personal experiences. It's a spectrum. A diverse and beautiful one at that. So, what have we learned today? Well, we've taken a deep dive into the intriguing topic of why gay men exist. We've explored the existence of homosexuality, a phenomenon that is not exclusive to humans but is seen across many species in the animal kingdom. We've acknowledged that this is not a choice, not a phase, and certainly not something to be cured. It is a part of the rich tapestry of life. We've navigated through the biological theories, understanding that genetics, hormones, and even birth order can play a role in determining one's sexual orientation. We've learned that it's not as simple as a gay gene, but rather, it's about a complex interplay of multiple genetic factors. Then, we shifted gears to psychological and sociological theories. We've seen how these theories suggest that our environment and experiences can influence our sexual orientation. But remember, these theories don't imply that being gay is a result of one's upbringing or environment, it's just that these elements can shape how our inherent sexual orientation manifests itself. We've also acknowledged the complexity of human sexuality. It's not a binary, not a switch that flips one way or the other, but a spectrum, a continuum that embraces a wide range of identities and orientations. We've recognized that sexuality is fluid, that it can evolve and change over time. It's a part of who we are, and it's as unique as we are. In the end, the why might not be as important as the who, who we are as individuals, as a community, and as a society. We've learned that understanding and acceptance are key to creating a world where everyone feels loved and valued for who they are. So let's continue to ask questions, to learn, and to grow. But most importantly, let's continue to embrace diversity, celebrate it. Because in diversity, we find strength and beauty.